Good afternoon, Atlanta Music Project, young musicians and friends. I'm Avril, and I'm happy to welcome you to another edition of AMP Online Masterclasses, sponsored by the Chestnut Family Foundation. This class is concepts of sound, learning scales, flexibility, and articulation for intermediate and advanced trumpet, taught by Dr. Mark Doolin. I invite you to participate by playing along at home and by answering questions in the chat. If you'd like, you can also have your video shown to demonstrate a concept as we go through the class. Also, if you don't already, please get your instrument out so that you can play along. So let's get started. Okay. All right, does this me now? Yes. Okay, all right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so uh, first of all, thanks for, for AMP for having me in to do this class. Um, before I get started with any exercises, I just wanted to say uh, the first thing I always want to address with students is the idea that you have to have a musical image in your mind um, before you start to play or you're starting to learn an instrument. You need to have a goal. A lot of times I see students uh, taught or thinking about things that are overly physical without a destination in mind. So. I'm going to give you two quotes uh, right off the bat. One is by Vincent Chikowitz. A, he was a trumpet teacher and, and uh, member of the Chicago Symphony that we'll talk about a little later. But a quote from him is, without a musical image in your mind, the difficulties of performing on an instrument are magnified greatly. Many of us assume that students have a good musical image, but I'm amazed how often this basic element is either absent or fades into the background. So. The importance of listening cannot be overstated. So you, uh, the importance of listening cannot be overstated and you have to constantly remind yourself of what's not only possible on your instrument, but what a good sound is, what you're trying to go for. Uh, the imagination is so important. Um, for me, probably the first really good trumpet sound I heard was Wynton Marsalis and that was not until I was in high school. So, you know, my first couple years of playing, uh, I was hearing myself or I was hearing other people in my beginning band class in Clover, South Carolina. And then the first time I heard Wynton, my jaw fell to the floor and I had no idea uh, an arpeggio could be played in tune because the first thing I heard him play was the Hummel Concerto um, on, a, on a CD. And so that's just super important. And I, I try to listen all the time. I think you'll find people that you like and that you want to emulate. Um, and at first, it'll probably be mostly on your instrument. But then uh, the more advanced you get musically, I think you'll start to imitate singers and string players and pianists and all those different kinds of instruments um, and see how they can apply to the sound you're trying to get. So and then really quickly, another quote is this from my teacher at Indiana University, John Rommel. And he said, the best players, I'll read this twice. The best players have a very specific idea about what they want to sound like and a very general idea of how they do it. Most players have a general idea of how they want to sound and a very specific idea about how they think they do it. So I'm going to read that again. The very best players have a very specific idea about what they want to sound like and a very general idea of how they want to do it. Most players have a general idea of how they want to sound and a very specific idea about how they think they do it. So what he's trying to say is that the best players have a very strong concept and a general sense of what it takes to make the instrument happen. But that most players kind of know what they want to sound like, sort of, and then they start manipulating things physically that they really don't understand what's going on because you can't always see it with the trumpet. The trumpet, we're dealing with air and air is invisible. So a lot of times some of the analogies that, that or some of the verbiage that we talk about with air can lead for people to do things overblown or uh, it can lead to other problems. So just fundamentally, you really, really want to make sure you have a good idea of sound. Um, another thing you want to make sure of is that uh, you're, you're practicing with a good strategy, you know, so in my practice, I try to practice about three times a day, varying lengths and depending on what my schedule is and what I have coming up. But in a general day, I'll play three to four times a day. And the first session is spent on fundamentals, which we'll get into in just a second. The next session is spent on probably more fundamentals and etudes. 
and then the rest of the time is spent on specific music that I'm going to work on. So playing the trumpet, the job is to play simple things very well. And what I mean by that is our music, if you compare it to that of a, a violinist or a pianist, it's not that complicated. However, uh, producing a sound on the trumpet is a completely different task than, than simply pressing on the keys. Not that there's not nuance to that, but the basic premise, uh, it takes a lot of time, and if you take time off, it can sound really bad. So in my fundamental session, I do some kind of long tones for tone production. I do some kind of flexibility practice. I do some kind of articulation, and I do something for my fingers. And a lot of these things do work together, but I, I find that I really need those four elements at least um, involved. I also sing a lot while I warm up. Uh, some of the patterns that I'll show you in a minute, uh, I, depending on what my voice feels like in a minute, I may or may not sing something. But it's important to sing so you, because then you really are sticking to the sound in your head. So, and if you guys have any questions along the way, please, please feel free to, to interject. So let's go, um, if we could put up the moving long tones one, I'll talk about that. A little bit and I'll try to watch my time so we make sure we get everybody in that wants to play a little bit sounds good so um, so with moving long tones one the way I want to approach the trumpet is I don't want to manipulate a lot um, the biggest danger we have when we're playing is that we see things vertically right and so we see a high note and our body tenses up and we see a low note and we let things sag and the most important thing is to try to take the same approach no matter what you're playing. So the first thing I have my students do uh, are some long tones. Now this doesn't look like long tones because they're quarter notes. But I'm going to have the same principle of just playing a G and I'm going to move up and down half steps on both sides. So. And so on. So this way, each time my approach is going to be as if I'm playing the first note and I'm just moving the vowels on top of it. Now, one way to think about wind, uh, we want you don't need to take a giant breath to play the trumpet. You need to take a breath that is appropriate to the sound that you want to produce. So if we were talking about this in verbiage, you would never say uh, take a giant breath before you whisper, right? You would go, hey. That would never work. You would get backed up and tight. Conversely, if you needed to yell something, you wouldn't not breathe in You because then you'd be straining and pushing. So the breath is going to be balanced by the natural stimulus of the sound that you want to produce. So that's some of the, that's some of the first exercises I do. The other thing I'm paying attention to right away at the beginning of the day are playing some easy long tones that you're actually able to diminuendo on. So just play a G by itself. And I'm not thinking about controlling the air so much. I'm thinking about what the diminuendo is going to be like at the end of the note. If you can diminuendo on a note and taper on it like that, then you're going to be in a sweet spot on the in instrument and you're not pushing. If you hear somebody playing and they end a note blah, like this, uh, then they're pushing and the sound is underneath the sweet spot and it gets very physical very fast. So just by simply taking an easy pitch that's able to produce a low C or a G, it kind of gets you in balance with the instrument. 
Another thing I like to say to students is, because we can't see the air, we need to, uh, you can imagine a violin bow. So if the, if the violin bow is in your right hand, and you take a breath in that's the up bow, the down bow is gliding in across the string, that's the air move lips, and then there's a, an easy release. So. And I can imagine the bow going up at the end so the pitch doesn't go flat. The kind of air that's needed for a lot of our playing, unless you're in extreme volumes, is the same kind that you would get for bend. You don't need to blow it out. But if you bend it, there's some flexibility to the wind. So I think we have a few questions here in the chat. Um, anything? Oh. No, not, not at this point. That's me not firing. Oh, OK. OK, sorry We've about got, that. Um, Yeah, we just have our, um, we've got a few kids here, and we're just asking them what pieces that they're working on for later on in the session. Oh, OK. I got you. I got you. I got, I got a feeling I know what they'll be doing. So that's the first thing. Uh, the next thing I do are some some exercises by Vincent Chickowitz, and I'm going to show that to you guys. So let's show that this way. And I don't know if I can make that any bigger right now. Um, but this exercise was written up. Uh, Vincent Chickowitz uh, was in the Chicago Symphony from 1952 to 1974. And this comes from a book that his son and I put together, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, and this was his long tone study. So they were moving long tones, just like what I showed you with the half step idea. But what he noticed was when brass players started playing lip slurs that just go through the overtone series, they started to manipulate the sound in the air. Sorry, I've been playing, I'm manipulating a lot. But they would start manipulating just going through a simple slur. So what he did was he wrote these exercises so as there is a fingered note in between each note that would be an open note on the harmonic series. So for example, the only open notes on this particular exercise are G and C. But you can see that there's an F sharp and an A on both of those. And you can also see the last three notes are a C major arpeggio. So he's starting on the dominant of the key, and it goes down the arpeggio. But there's a fingered pitch in between each open note. Also notice that every note in this, with the exception of the half step that's on the second note, is in the key of C. So if you look at this one where we go back up to the tonic, you can see that all these notes are in the key of C, so you should be able to start hearing where those notes are in the scale. And again, there's a finger note in between the two open pitches. So um, you said you, yeah. you compiled this, um, you, or you helped to compile the book that these exercises are contained in? Yes. Um, so, the, yeah, the way that happened was uh, when I was a student at Indiana, my teacher, John Rommel, used a lot of Mr. Chickowitz's exercises. And actually, I was there his first year. John's been there 30 years now. But uh, I was there his first year, which seems like yesterday. And um, he would go to Northwestern where Chickowitz taught and watch him teach for a week his first year. A couple times a year, he would do that. And then he would come back and do everything on us. And so I felt like always he had a pretty good concept of the things that Mr. Chickowitz was teaching. And then he would, he would work those into his teaching with us. So in 2009, I cold called uh, Vince Chickowitz's son, Michael. And Michael's a trumpet player, but he's opposite from his dad. 
Michael is uh, more of a rock and roll lead trumpet player. He played with Tower Power, Huey Lewis, Rod Stewart. Um, he's on the We Are the World record. You know, a bunch of different stuff. And so we met in Chicago. He had not met me before. And I basically went up and said, we need to put your dad's stuff. Because his father passed away in 2006. And I said, we need to put your stuff in, down in print or that stuff's going to go away. Because these exercises survived in photocopy form as did a bunch of etudes he would use with his students. So now what we've done is we've taken uh, all the exercises that he wrote, which is basically this one exercise just expanded, and then a lot of etudes, which he called flow studies, um, and we put those into three different books, and they're recordings of his former students playing them on the recording. So these recordings on our books, uh, the principal trumpet in the Boston Symphony, Tom Rolfs, is playing these. Um, and there's a CD of Tom playing him down. The other uh, recordings are recordings of the etudes and recordings of him presenting a master class. Okay. And also in the book, there is an interview that one of his students did. Uh, there's an article that he wrote. Uh, we just tried to get as much of his pedagogy in one place laid out very clearly. Uh, there's a lot of work of uh, writing from some of his former students explaining things. Um, and let me plug my computer in because I just saw the low battery thing come up. Okay. And, um, and the reason why I was so interested um, in it, and, and we don't want to spend too much time on, on this topic, but I, I was so interested in it because I know that these work, um, and yeah, I yeah. just know that they work. They work, and, and, they're, and they've been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and our main goal was to make sure that there was some of his, his original work was in there. We didn't manipulate anything to customize about how I might think about it. Um, and we just kind of put it together and just, and just presented it. And actually, then uh, the last thing I'll say about this is one of the cool things was there's an interview with him in one the second book uh, from, with one of his former students. And one of the questions was, now that you're retired, what kind of projects are you going to have? And he said, well, I'd like to compile a book of flow studies with uh, commentary and ideas about how to do them. It had been months since I had read that interview. And we were just about to print it. And then I read his answer and I realized we had done exactly what he wanted <laughs> to do within the book. So it was kind of cool that way. So, but that's, this is a very important exercise. Um, yeah, we've sold like 15,000 of these books in the past several years. So, but that's, you can see how this is laid out and it continues up. And I usually do about 10 pages of these up to like a high C or high D. Um, and that's the first 20 minutes of my warm up. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I'll say about that. Okay. Really quick, really quickly. The next thing I want to say is uh, about flexibility. So, and then I think we'll probably get to some playing in a little bit after this. But, oh, well, just a couple things. Uh, before I get too caught up into uh, some of the techniques, I want to say a lot of times students are worried about the embouchure. The embouchure comes in all shapes and sizes. The, it is a result, it develops as a result of the sound concepts you have in your mind and the specific musical materials that you are practicing, okay? So that's how it develops. But how it works is, you know, the lips have to be inside the mouthpiece. And if you're playing, the only real problems I see with students are when they're playing and they wind up playing in the red part of the lip. And what I mean by that is if they're playing under here or under here. Um, that or they're just too tight. So the two things I see students do that I try to look out for, especially if there's anybody who's a band director watching this, is one, the lesser of the common problems, is they put it on their face and they tighten everything up because they're trying to form an embouchure. Well, an embouchure is kind of like a loose floating thing until it's activated. So they're tightening up and they're blowing really hard at something that's preset and tense. And that's going to cause a lot of problems. That's when the students start to pull back and, and they lose vibrating surface in the embouchure. So you don't want to do that. 
The other thing that they do is they breathe as they're putting the instrument on the face, and this is more common. So I see students going and then planting it on their face, and then they wind up in a different spot or they wind up disturbing the lip and pushing it into the red part. Uh, I often find most of my students should never start on a 7C. I think a 5C fits students better and they can play on it longer. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, and actually, I am, I'm a Bach clinician and I do know that now dealers can ask for a 5 or a 7C for beginning trumpets, just if anybody's interested in that. So that's what I would say about embouchures. But if you think about the embouchure, uh, like I said, it's not activated until the wind hits. So the analogy I use with students is that if you think about the embouchure, it's like those old sails on the clipper ships, right? You've seen like Pirates of the Caribbean and they've got the giant ships. Um, those sails are not tight, but they're loose, but they're in a position to catch the wind. So that's the same thing with our embouchure on the trumpet. I have it on my face, but I'm not tight. However, the mouthpiece is inside the lips. All I have to do is take an easy breath, and when I release the air, the embouchure is in place to accept the wind, and then it's activated. So there's no embouchure yet. But once the air hits, then everything goes in place. So any thoughts about presetting an embouchure or tightening up or all these other things are kind of a moot point if you tighten things up or you don't have a healthy breath behind it. So um, two other points of technique and then we'll, we'll hear some people play. Um, about, uh, well, let's talk about uh, flexibility first and then we'll get into scales because I know that's another topic we're going to talk about today. Um, with flexibility, if you can go to one, is it one A is what I sent you, I think? Let's see. There we go. Okay, so this is a flexibility exercise I wrote. Now, you might look at this at first and think there's only one lip slur, but that's sort of true. If you are a brass player or... Um, if you're maybe maybe some woodwind teachers who are band directors will see this. If you can understand that if I say on the third space C, all the notes between that third space C and the G sharp belong like in a group together, right? It's not until you go to the G that you're in a different partial. By partials, we mean the all the open notes that come out. <laughs> Right? So in between G, I mean, in between third space C and G sharp, you have all these notes. Those notes feel very close together. Notice one of the notes I played in there was an A. So once I go G to A, I'm already in the partial with the C. Does that make sense? So, so in other words, this A and this C are in the same block, <laughs> okay? And so once I go G to A, I've crossed into that, that next street. So instead of a student aiming with all their physical might to get from one partial to the next, I want them to go up to the A so it's a little bit easier, like this, And then they're not physically manipulating to get that C out. Mr. Mark, um, this, yes. is, this is really good information. I just want to note for um, Michael and Jasir in your class earlier today, you all were doing lip slurs with Mr. Jaron. And Mr. Jaron was going G, C, G, C, G, C, G, C, something like that, where the jump was bigger. So um, if you guys, if you all will work on this exercise, Flexibility 1A, it'll get you into that lip slur a lot easier. So it won't be as difficult. Right. Yeah. And, and you can take the exercise you just described and you, you can gradually get there by going G, A, G, C. So you're feeling that where that note is, where that, that to get to the next partial easy, 
you know, so you're imitating it. So okay. if this one is that one can be and then we gradually move to where you might not need all of those steps within that. So, but it's important to note that when you do this exercise this way, you're able to put that C in the sweet spot on the horn where it sounds the most resonant. A lot of times with beginner, younger players, if they're going G to C, they're forcing that C into place and they actually wind up playing a little bit flat. And what that does is it disturbs the length, I mean the width between the C and the G in the slur and it makes it bumpy and out of tune. So if you can immediately start to get that C in tune and in a sweet spot, your slur down to the G will be much easier. Okay? So, and let's real quick, let's do uh, one, the third one. Da 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 ba da 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 da. I think that's one C. There we go. Yeah. Now this one, the flexibility in this one truly is the last three notes. But again, I want to get those, I want to go into that C thinking mel melodically and not physically. so on so that's that's another way so you can get that slur that goes down to be smooth and in tune because the place you're coming from is in the sweet spot and is a it's a musical idea because you're trying to ring there the la and um, so all this leads me to scales because I know that's a topic we want to cover today um, and I think I have a page in there called learning scales in the handouts okay so Word document. Now, uh, while while he's pulling that up, one of the uh, one things I want to say is uh, Arnold Jacobs was uh, the titan of brass pedagogy. If you don't know who Arnold Jacobs was, he was a tuba player in Chicago Symphony from 1944 to 1988, um, and he passed away. I believe it was 1998, 99. And I only had one lesson with him, but uh, there were a lot of things he said and that were written about him and by him that are great, great things to say. And one thing he would say all the time was, make statements, don't ask questions. And how this applies to scales is you really need to not have any questions about scales or how, they're fin or how the notes are fingered. So one thing I would say to students right away is know your chromatic scale is I mean, not as fast in terms of tempo, but know it right away. So you are not having to look up in a book, how do I finger this note? So you understand in harmonic spellings that G flat and F sharp are the same note, or that, or that C flat and B natural are the same note. So you don't have any of those questions in your mind that are going to inhibit your music making when you see things on paper. So that's really important. Also, the chromatic scale is good because then you can work on range because you're just going up a half step at a time, uh, and because things are in a half step away from each other, you're not going to manipulate so much as you go up and down the scales. Now, the, the way I see students usually learn scales on the trumpet, uh, and any, uh, I'll speak in trumpet keys for a second, they learn the C, F, and G scales first, so they learn B flat, E flat, and F concert scales. The reasoning behind that is because you're dealing with a large band class, tons of different fingerings, tons of different instruments. It would take a long time to get all those fingerings down. But uh, in a perfect world, I think the student, the way I teach scales to students first are I teach them uh, their C scale on the trumpet is C scale, so B flat concert. I teach B flat and I teach B natural and I teach D flat. And the reason behind that is that there is all of those notes are very close together. They're in a range that most students can have no problem playing in. 
and they're not going over the break. So Herbert Clark, the great cornet soloist who wrote Clark's technical studies, if you've heard st players play. <laughs> Well, that's Clark, Clark's technical study number two. He wrote in, in the technical studies, which doesn't, do not have a lot of instructions, but in his fourth study, he talked about that there's a slight acoustical gap between a B natural in the staff and a C sharp, and between a C and a D. So the scales I just mentioned do not go over those breaks by a whole step. Right? So I want my students to feel very successful and very secure and know a lot of fingerings right away. So we're getting rid of notes being unfamiliar. We're also playing correctly without having to manipulate it all to go over that break. And then very quickly, they've learned four scales. So there's a lot of times it's when they're going to learn an E flat concert scale or the trumpet F scale right away. When they go over that C to D break, they're really having to work to get up there and they're establishing a negative habit right away by having to manipulate. If they've learned these four scales that I talked about right away, their air is moving fine, they've developed the embouchure nicely, they have confidence with the fingers, and they have an ear that tells them where to put notes in the sound. Um, and so the other thing I'll say about scales is I don't like to use scale sheets at all, ever. Um, because I think that scale sheets, even for beginners right out of the gate, teach them to do it as a crutch. So maybe I'll give them like a C, C major scale so they can see what it looks like. But if you understand that sharps and flats come in a certain order, B, E, A, D, G, C, F, and the sharps are F, C, G, D, A, E, B, if you can memorize this, and I have my students write this chart down, and that you're never going to have a scale that will have an E flat without also having a B flat, or it'll have a G flat without also having a D, A, E, and B flat in the key signature. If you understand that, then you'll understand this chart at the bottom. So let's say, for example, we're going to learn a D major scale, and it's a sharp scale. There's two sharps. The first two sharps in the order of sharps are F and C. So a D scale starts on a D, and you're going to alphabetically go D to D. So if I do that with no sharps and flats, it sounds like this. That's not a major scale, so Dorian scale. But if I know that it has two sharps, and those two sharps are F and C, all I have to do are alter those notes when I play. So I'm going D to D alphabetically, musically alpha, musical alphabet that is, and I'm just, manip I'm just changing those two notes to sharps. And that's really all there is to the construction of scales. We know that if you study in music theory class, you'll hear in a major scale, a half step between the third and fourth and seventh and eighth notes. But that's a lot to think about when you're trying to learn the scale. If you want to think about half steps and whole steps, I think that's a lot to think about. So I think you're better off understanding that there is a formula and then implementing that formula. So if we look at one more, let's look at B flat. B flat has two flats. The first two flats are B flat and E flat. So we're going to go from B flat to B flat. And the only notes that are altered are the B flat, which is the, the tonic, and the fourth note, which is the E flat. And that formula comes out nicely. Now, when you have scales that have a lot of sharps and a lot of flats, it may be easier to think about it the opposite way and think about what notes are actually natural. So if we were going to have a B major scale, it has hey, five sharps. Yep, Dr. sorry, I'm going too far. <laughs> well, it's, it's great information, but I'm looking at the time and it's really oh, okay. Okay. away from let's us. Get, 
let's get somebody here. But I'll just say real quick, if you're looking at a B scale, there's mm -hmm. five sharps. The only two, there's one, two, three, four, five. The only notes that are natural are E and B. So if you go B to B and the only notes that are natural are the B and the E and everything else is sharp, then it's not that hard to learn either. So, okay, let's hear somebody play. Who, who do we have here? Or do we have any questions yet? Um, we, do have, we do have a question. Um, the flexibility okay. exercises, are they beneficial for all brass instruments? Yes. And we've got, um, we've got several participants in the house. Uh, and um, I think for today, um, Tarek is working on something and um, we'd like to bring his video up. And okay. um, what would you have him play? Would you have him play what he's working on in his yeah. lesson? Let's do oh. that. Let's, let's uh, yeah. I like to hear him play one of the Getchel etudes that we're working on. Oh, Great. and just, just so, yeah, so, you know, so the, uh, the book I was talking about that we did looks like this. And um, once COVID's over, all the AMP students will be working out of that. We've been working out of it right now with some photocopies. The book he's going to use right now is, are the Getchell studies. And I think they're all these practical studies are written for all brass instruments and they're very good. There's two books for each brass instrument and the trumpet one, I use it all the time. So, all right, all right. So yeah, we've got those and I'm also going to put up um, the, your website where you have the um, student handouts link. Yes. And that will take them to the flexibility exercises um, yeah. that, and, and, and other things too. The, uh, everything, actually, the scales and, and everything. So if you guys, okay. if y'all visit the link that I'm putting in the chat. All right, Tariq, thank you for, um, for showing us your video um, and we're going to get started. Let's, let's hear what you have been working on. Hey, Tariq, which one are you going to play? Uh, you signed uh, 11 through 13. I mean, okay. Okay. So which one's your favorite? Ten. Ten. Okay. Okay. All Play. right. One. I'm all set. Okay. Okay, good job. So a couple things I thought were good right away, right? Note-wise, you got all the notes, which is always a big plus. And I thought rhythmically your tempo is pretty steady. Okay, what did you hear? Yeah, I kept the steady tempo and... Uh... Okay, so one thing, that, what, one thing we've been working on with these etudes is we've been talking about the form of the etudes. Because if you, can, if you can decipher the composer's language on the page, it's going to give you a lot of instructions other than just the notes on the page, right? So uh, a lot of times with these Getchel etudes, they're very good in the beginning about making four-bar phrases. But you are breathing about every two bars, right? So you want to think about that uncle that you have that's going to tell a story, but it gets like caught up too much in between the main idea. That's like taking a breath every two bars, right? You want to get the idea out so it's very clear so people understand it. So the other thing is, are the articulations? Are you slurring them where they're slurred or are you tonguing them where they're tongued, right? So this uh, etude has an A, B, A form. And what I mean by that is the main idea 
which we're going to talk about, which is uh, made of two four bar phrases. There's a development section, the B section, which is one four measure phrase. Um, well, two, actually two four bar phrases. And then what we call another A section or a recapitulation that's the beginning, ma the material that wraps up at the end of the A2. So, Tark, let's have you play. Let me play it first. We're going to play the first two phrases, and I want you to make them in, make them with four bars. Third notes articulated, right? Oh. So, so at this, we're only working that much. So I want you to make sure you get all the details in. So you have to tongue the third and fourth beats. Ta 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 ta. And then I want you to keep in mind. The composer is going to write those articulations because the articulation is part of the sound and they're going to have you emphasize something. So if you'll notice, the tune is da ta 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 He has three Fs in a row that he articulates. So he must be wanting you to make something of those, right? So now try it again with, with the right articulations. Okay, that was better in terms of the articulations, right? But there were still a couple where you were slurring and tonguing in the opposite places. But you know where that is, so I won't... I won't beat that one out too much. So, do you remember what the musical device was we talked about? Bum ba da dee da dum ba da dee da 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 dee da 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 dum. Starts with an S. Do you remember that? A sequence, right? A sequence. So you want to learn to look for musical sequences in this, so you'll have a better idea of what to say. For example. He marks this mezzo piano without any other instructions for, for eight bars, but I really doubt that he wants it to just be boring, right? So when you have sequences that are repeated, the composer is going to write that to give it some kind of musical direction and emphasis. Okay? So. That was all the same sequence. Then on the second phrase, he changes the sequence and it goes down. So we have a sequence up and a sequence down. So the listener has a logical sense of where the music's going. So Dr. Dooley, you do, yes. Um, I hate to interrupt. We're we're <laughs> okay. approaching we're approaching the end of the webinar, so I want to ask you um, oh. while while I talk for a second, I want to ask you to think about um, a good summary. If you were to to encapsulate everything that you said into a quick thirty or forty five seconds, um, what okay. what are the most important things that you want the kids to take away? And then also everyone that's out there, um, we have the um, link to Dr. Doolin's website where a lot of these exercises are contained and then Dr. Doolin also showed the books that um that contain um the other um things that yeah. we worked on as well okay Dr. Doolin would you all right so I would say number one you've got to find some role models to listen to and those role models are going to change as you get older and you're going to go back and forth but you need to find the best sound that you want to emulate 
and make that your own. The second thing is you want to practice consistently and you want to have a plan for what you're going to practice. And you want to learn your scales quickly. You want to learn all of them. You want to get rid of all doubts about fingerings or anything like that. And when it comes to uh, learning music, you really need to learn more than just the notes. You really want to learn what are the, what are the mechanisms the composer uses to, uh, to make music out of that. Now, I wouldn't have known this stuff when I was a beginner, and I went to school for a long time for it. But you want to have those things pointed out so you can make music in a natural, organic way that makes sense for the listener. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, we're definitely going to do this again. Um, and we will see you on our next um, Atlanta Music Project Masterclass. Um, have a wonderful day.